So in this morning's message, um, we're continuing our journey through the book of John, and we come to a place where Jesus has now entered the city of Jerusalem and is preparing to go to his death on the cross, and it is um, the night before the Passover feast was to begin, and the Lord, throughout his ministry on the earth, he grew very close to his disciples, and he genuinely wanted them to come to a clear understanding of what it was that he had come into the world to accomplish. However, his desire was not just to to show them what he wanted to achieve, which he did want them to understand, but he wanted them to see the attitude that he embraced in accomplishing his mission, and why he did what he did. Now, we've been making our way verse to verse through the book of John, and we're going to continue in John chapter 13 this morning. So if you have your Bibles or you'd like to follow along, John chapter 13, starting with verse 1. And my message is all about how God has called the leaders of his church to be servants. Starting with verse 1 in chapter 13, it was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. We read in verse 2, The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. So when we look at the first verse that I've read here in this chapter, you almost see an introduction to what's going to be taking place in John chapter 13, chapter 14, and chapter 15. We're standing on somewhat of holy ground here when we look at this. At this timeline, at this place in the timeline of Jesus' ministry, we're less than 24 hours away from the cross. Now in verse 1, Jesus is doing what many of us would do or would want to do in our last hours if we knew that our time was was coming. Jesus had completed the end of his public ministry, and in the calm that was before them, Jesus wanted to prepare his disciples for what he knew that they would have to face in the storm that was just around the corner. Not only a storm in the next few hours, but also over the coming years. And it all begins with this Passover meal that they were going to have together, specifically prepared in a special room. And John describes very little concerning how this meal was set up, but he focuses attention on stating how the Lord knew that he was about to do for all of them the very best thing that he could do, and that he loved all of them who was very own. And he loved them to the very end. To provide proper context for what John is saying here in chapter 13, it's good that we have parallel texts in other Gospels in the Bible that shed light on other details of what was taking place. So in context with what was happening here with the disciples gathering for the Last Supper, The Gospel of Luke explains how the preparations for the Passover meal on this occasion were to be made. Luke chapter 22, verses 1 to 20. I'm going to read it. Now the festival of unleavened bread, called the Passover, was approaching. And the chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for some way to get rid of Jesus 
for they were afraid of the people. Then Satan entered Judas, called Iscariot, one of the twelve. And Judas went to the chief priests and the officers of the temple guard and discussed with them how he might betray Jesus. They were delighted and agreed to give him money. He consented and watched for an opportunity to hand Jesus over to them when no crowd was present. Then the day of the unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb, then, then came the day of the unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John saying, Go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare it? They asked. He replied, As you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters and say to the owner of the house, The teacher asks, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, all furnished. Make preparations there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. So you almost have to envision the setting here and what is transpiring. The Last Supper wasn't at all like what we imagine it to be when we look at the painting of Leonardo da Vinci. And you see this table with him pulled up in chairs in a certain way, all together in a row. No, no, that's not what it was like. You see, it's not like what we do in a modern day where we sit around a table for potluck or where you sit at home around chairs for our dinners. See, the Jews of that day, they ate around a table called a triclinium. And what a triclinium was, it was like a coffee table kind of height table. And all the food and things would be placed on there in courses. And it was for special occasions that they would use a triclinium set up. It was they would actually lay down on their side with their feet outward facing each other around the table and they'd be reclined on almost like these couches. So they weren't sitting on chairs kind of pulled up to a table, they were reclining around this triclinium. It was a U-shaped circle and the food would be brought in on the center and everybody would be sitting around or be reclining around the table. It was a very personal, very social kind of way of having dinner. Now, Jesus instructs his disciples that they're to go out and look for a man carrying a water pitcher and to follow him home. And this would have been an easy thing for them to do because in those days, generally it was the ladies that carried the water. So they went out, and sure enough, there was this guy carrying water, and they just followed him all the way home. The Lord had a specific plan for this. See, Judas had already made arrangements at this time, and if we look at the parallel Gospels, Judas had already made arrangements to betray Jesus, and they were looking for an opp- he was looking for an opportunity where Jesus would be alone or not near any crowds, where they, he could betray him into the hands of the chief priests. So he was already there. He was already looking for an opportunity. And I think what's happened here is Jesus kind of said, you know what? We're going to have Passover, and supernaturally, this is how it's going to happen. Because it wasn't time for Jesus to be led astray or led, us, led, led, led away to be crucified yet. Jesus had a very important appointment with his disciples, a very personal appointment with them. He needed to show them and teach them some important lessons that they were going to need as they walked through life and carried the gospel, the good news of his salvation plan out into the world. You see, 
To observe the Passover meal, the disciples would have to obtain unleavened bread, spices, fruit, wine, and a sacrifice, a sacrifice lamb. There was a lot of preparation that went into the Passover meal. The borrowed room had to be searched for any trace of yeast. Any crumb of bread had to be removed. You see, the yeast represented evil influence, the evil influence of Egypt that the Jews were leaving behind in the Exodus. Yeast came to be known as the influence of sin. So this is why they ate unleavened bread at the Passover. There's all these preparations they had to make. But he knew, Jesus knew that he wanted to impart lessons in love that would have a lasting impression on his disciples. Now, Jesus loved the world very much. We see that in John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, right? He loved them. But there was an extra special bond and an extra special relational connectedness that Jesus had to the twelve. And he wanted to express some things to them in a very personal way. These were the future leaders of the church that would go throughout the whole world of which we are a part over 2,000 years later. He was here in the upper room where they were to participate in the first communion service. The first lesson that Jesus wanted to impart on his disciples. In Matthew 26, 26 to 28, we read, While they were eating, Jesus took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. And then he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to, to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. My friends, just as the disciples had to prepare for the Last Supper, the Passover meal, the communion meal that we take in commemoration of the death of Jesus Christ for our sins, must, we must prepare in our hearts in the same manner. We must Examine our hearts to see if there is any yeast of sin that is in our lives and ask the Lord to sweep it away. We must prepare our hearts to receive the Passover meal, the communion meal. We come to the table with hearts expecting and prepared and focused not on ourselves but on Jesus Christ in thanksgiving for what He gives to us, the life that He gives to us. The yeast of sin must be removed from our lives through confession and repentance. And when we recognize the power of forgiveness and restoration in the work of Jesus for us on the cross, then we are able to worthily take communion in a humble recognition for all that he has done for us. And once we've humbly aligned with God in our attitude and posture by recognizing the authority that is resident in Jesus our Savior, then God prepares us. He prepares us to go out into the world in service for him and in service to him. You see, verse 3 of chapter 13 in John continues. He says, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and he was returning to God. So he got up from the meal. And what did he do? He got up from the meal. And he took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel, towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. I don't know if you've connected this 
to communion before, but this is a very important principle. God gives us communion so that we can remember what He did for us so that we in turn can serve Him and serve the others that He has placed in our sphere. Jesus, here we see Him. Creator and sustainer of the entire universe exemplifying the nature and work of a servant. No, when we come here today, it's not just about me and what Jesus does for me. Yes, He's my personal Savior. But we come into service for Christ. Why? Because God has called us to be like Him. And there is no retirement plan in the kingdom of God. You don't retire from serving the Lord. He has called you to be participators with Him in the divine nature. And that means taking our lives and pouring our lives out for Him just as He poured His life out for us. You see, this meant that to prepare the disciples for the future leadership of His church, and that's what this first communion meal, the Passover meal, was all about. Jesus wanted to teach them. They had to be willing to stoop down and take on tasks that were not necessarily common for leaders or people of status to pursue. When we look at the life and ministry of Jesus, each of, each of the Gospels brings a different aspect of the same events. And it's beautiful. The tapestry that's created as you weave it all together. We see an example of this of what we just read in John 13, 3 to 5. The foot washing is recorded in John. But the context for the foot washing is found in Luke's gospel. You see, after Judas identify, is identified as the betrayer, a discussion takes place amongst the other disciples as who would be greatest in the kingdom of God. In Luke 22, 24 to 27, we read... And this is during the communion, the Passover meal. Judas is identified as the betrayer. And then there's this discussion, well, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of God? A dispute also arose among them as to which of them was considered the greatest. These are the 12 disciples that had followed Christ throughout his ministry. They still didn't understand. Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them. And the, those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should learn, should, should be like the youngest. Listen to these words, folks. It's so important. The greatest among you should be like the youngest and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? It is not the one who is at the... Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. I am among you as one who serves. The great I am is among them as one who serves. This is so countercultural. What is recorded in Luke serves as the context for what we see here in our text in John chapter 13, 4 and 5. Jesus has got up from the table and he prepared to, himself to serve his disciples by getting a basin of water and a towel. He removed his outer cloak as a signal that he was ready to roll up his sleeves and do a task that was meant for servants to do. The creator of the universe rolls up his sleeves and stoops down to scrub the disciples' feet. He was, in fact, the creator of the universe. He was, in fact, very much aware of his deity. He knew the work that had been committed him to do 
and he postured himself as a servant, taking on a job that nobody as a king would ever consider participating in. And in the eastern lands of this era, the use of open sandals made it necessary to wash one's feet frequently. It was dusty and dirty out there, and they'd come into the house with dirty feet, and it was a common courtesy for a host to arrange to have a servant of the house wash the feet of his guests. Other religious leaders of the day, like the Pharisees and the Sadducees, would never take on a job like Jesus took on for the betterment of His disciples. They would have wanted to keep the dignity of their positions intact by expecting others to serve them because they had come to a place where they expected that. A place of honor. What Jesus did as a leader was to serve as an example for the twelve to follow as they went out into the world and were the start of His church. Countercultural. Completely countercultural. As Jesus demonstrated His example of godly leadership, He came to Simon Peter. And now you can picture this, okay? So here they are, reclined on cushions with their feet facing out, and Jesus gets up and He goes around in a circle and He grabs onto their feet and pulls off their sandals and He starts scrubbing their feet. And then He takes the towel that He's wearing and He dries their feet off. And He comes up to Simon Peter in verse 6. He's saying, it came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? As if to say, this is so far below you, Lord. What are you doing? You can't... You, you shouldn't be washing my feet. Jesus replied, you don't un- realize what I'm doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then, the Lord, then Lord Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. I want you to pay attention to this next part here. Jesus answered, Those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. So here's Jesus. He is the divine host of this Passover meal. And the honored guest became the servant of the banquet, performing the lowly service of foot washing. And amongst those whom Jesus was providing this service to was in fact a traitor. And Jesus knew it. He knew the traitor was among them. And he knew the traitor was there and would betray him. And yet when he came to Judas, Jesus pulled off Judas' sandals and he began to scrub his feet. And like all the other disciples, he washed his feet and he dried them off. What a picture. What a picture with full knowledge of what was about to transpire. Jesus scrubbed Judas' feet. What a lesson to emulate. Am I someone who could do this? Knowing that the person that I was serving would betray me and there'd be a big knife plunging into my back of betrayal? Could I honestly have this posture with the knowledge that that could be? I know in my flesh I couldn't. But friends, it is no longer I that liveth, but Christ that liveth in me. 
Therefore, the things that I do in this body and the things that you do in your body, in your body, you do as though Christ is living in you because He is. Therefore, take on the attitude of Christ, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but He took the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. He became obedient even unto death on a cross. And Jesus did this to save us and to bring us into a participation with Him in the kingdom of God. And the Lord is alive in His people. He's alive in His people. That means He lives. He lives in you if you believe. And He lives in me. So I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. All things. Even face my betrayer and love them despite what I know is coming. Continuing in John 13, 12, we read, when he had finished washing their feet, he put on cl his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I did have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who was sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. The questions of our Savior here make an interesting study. They form one of the most effective methods of teaching. If the Lord washes His disciples' feet, what excuse could they have not to wash each other's feet? In the kingdom of God, the highest rank in the power structure of the kingdom is that of the servant. In doing this, the Lord not only introduced a sacrament of literal foot washing, sorry, of, of communion, he demonstrated through the sacrament that to be united with Him was to become the servant of all. See, this, the communion is a sacrament. The foot washing is the spin-off of the sacrament. Have you been united to Christ? By the power of the Spirit? If you believe, yes, you have. Therefore, let the unity that you have with the Spirit send you into His world to be a foot washer. Remember, Matthew 20, 25 to 26, and we've already spoken this, but it's so important. Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Whoever, instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. See, Jesus knew the hearts of all his disciples. To know the teachings of Jesus concerning humility, unselfishness, and servanthood is one thing. But to practice it is quite another. You see, among the disciples that were there was Judas. Judas. 
It's a heart-wrenching story. What happened? Judas walked with the other eleven, with Jesus. They saw Jesus bring sight to the blind. He saw Jesus walking to him out on the water. He even got sent out two by two with the other disciples and saw miracles performed in the name of Jesus through his own hands. Judas saw it all, and yet his heart was far from God. Because Judas had a vice. Judas had something that he was not willing to surrender to the Lord, and he held on to that vice. He had greed in his heart. And his money was more important to him than the kingdom of God and everything that was being done, even though he walked with the Lord. And Jesus said in verse 17, we repeat of our text, now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. But he continues in verse 18 saying, I am not referring to all of you. I know that I have chosen... But this is to fulfill the passage of Scripture, he who shared my bread has turned against me. I'm telling you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am who I am. Very true, I tell you. Very truly, I tell you. Whoever accepts anyone I send, accepts me. He's talking to the ones that are going to go out after he is crucified and resurrected and ascended into heaven. These disciples are the ones that are going out. And he says, I'm telling you now before it happens, what everything that he's saying here. Whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me, and whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. After he had said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit. He was troubled in spirit because he knew. And he testified. Very truly, I tell you. One of you is going to betray me. His disciples stared at one another at a loss to know what he meant. One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter motioned to this disciple and said, Ask him which one he means. Leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? See, Judas was among them, they didn't know it. They couldn't discern. Judas played it very well. Outwardly, he looked like a follower of Christ, a disciple of Christ. But his heart was given over to this evil that he, would, he was refusing to surrender. The apostle Peter was stumped. He didn't know who it was. So John, the closest of the, the 12 disciples, the closest friend to Jesus out of the 12, Peter says to John, hey, why don't you go ask Jesus and see if he'll tell us who this is. They were stumped. They had no clue. Only Judas knew that he was not a true believer. Only Judas knew. He was the only one following Jesus of the, of the twelve, as a means for his own fleshly enrichment and financial gain in this world. Sadly, so sad, even though people were raised from the dead in front of his very eyes, he never intended to be a servant of God because he loved his money so much and the things of this world more than a Christ. And Jesus was disturbed by this. Even though he knew it was going to happen, he was still distraught in his spirit over this. This begs a question for all of us who have come to follow Christ. What does it mean to follow Christ? Is it crossing your chest before you do anything or coming to church faithfully? Is that what it means to follow Christ? Are we here this morning in this place 
in this church, I'm going to ask the question. Are we in this place this morning to serve the Lord and His interests in serving Him and His people? To become foot washers? Or are we just here for ourselves so that we can go away feeling somehow good about ourselves and enriched by the time we've spent here? I can't answer this question for you. God is the only one who knows the heart. But I'm telling you that every person ought to examine their hearts to see if they're in the faith or not. Is your Christianity just a decoration that you hang on your door or around your neck? Or is your Christianity life-changing service to the Almighty God and His purposes in this world? For my friend, we are all called to participate with Christ in what He is doing. This is not about what we can get out of the deal. This is what we can give to God. God did, God did not create the world for us. He created the world for Himself. And it's not selfish because He loves us and He wants to bring us in to be with Him. Not just here, but for all of eternity. He's sovereign, King of kings and Lord of lords. And He gave so much to bring us in. But this is not about me. This is about glorifying Him. He is the Creator. And sometimes we think of love selfishly. But God didn't think of love selfishly. He chose to take the hard road to make a way so that we could be close to Him. That's what He did. And He says, if you want to follow after Me, you must pick up your cross and follow Me. And a cross is a place to die on, to die on to self. Because in our sinful nature, all we want to do is serve ourselves. But if we want to save our lives, we must give our lives. For if we give our lives to the Lord for His sake, for His name's sake, we will find life. That's what taking up a cross is. Being willing to say, flesh, you have to go. Jesus, save me. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a right spirit in me. Help me to follow you, God, and to serve you, God, and to serve those that you put in my path the way that you served Oh, my friends. You see, we need foot washing. All the time, I need a foot washing from God. Those who have had a bath, this is talking about those who have come to salvation through Christ because He cleanses the body. He cleanses our whole being. When we ask Jesus to forgive us for our sins and we repent and we follow Him, we turn away from our life of sin, Jesus comes in. The Holy Spirit of Christ enters into us. The Holy Spirit comes and lives here. Therefore, I'm no longer my own. I was purchased with the precious blood of Jesus, the price that was paid for my salvation. And the Spirit bears testimony that I am His, and He comes and lives in me. He comes and lives in me. Jesus cleans me and fills me with new life. But walking in this dusty, dirty old world, everywhere we go, our feet get dirty. We need to come. And this is why before communion, we ask that everybody analyze their hearts and see if there's anything that needs to be washed off of the feet. And today, you see, Jesus loved His disciples, including Judas, right to the very end. God didn't force Judas to do what He did. He chose to do it but he knew that Judas would. That was even harder for him to swallow, I'm sure, when it came to washing his feet. Because the other disciples were clued out. Hey, he's the guy that handles the money, so I don't have to. Right on. Right? 
They had no idea that Judas' heart was full of corruption. They didn't know that. But Judas knew it, and he came to the point where he opened his heart up to the demonic. He, so, he looked at the work of Christ and everything that it meant, and yet he turned his back away, and he turned away. I close my message today in the words of James Orr, who wrote a song in 1936. which says this, Search me, O God, and know my heart today. Try me, my Savior. Know my thoughts, I pray. See if there be some wicked way in me. Cleanse me from every sin and set me free. I praise Thee, Lord, for cleansing me from sin. Fulfill Thy word and make me pure within. Fill me with fire where I once burned with shame. Grant my desire to magnify thy name. Lord, take my life and make it wholly thine. Fill my poor heart with thy great love divine. Take all my will, my passion, self, and pride. I now surrender, Lord, in me abide. O Holy Ghost, revival comes from Thee. Send a revival. Start the work in me. Thy Word declares that will supply our need for blessings now, O Lord. I humbly plead. Is this your heart cry? Lord, have mercy upon Your people. God, you know how we need foot washing and how you've called us, Lord, to serve one another and wash each other's feet too. God, forgive us. Forgive us for the things that we find ourselves entangled with in this world. You know our hearts, Lord. You see everything. There's nothing that escapes your gaze. Lord, today I... I pray that each of us would rend our hearts and not our garments, Lord, that we would humble ourselves before you and admit our need for you because we need you, Lord. We need you every hour, God. We need you. Would you come, O Lord, and revive these hearts of ours so that you could do your work in effectiveness through this body of believers that are called by your name. Lord, we are your disciples. We've called out to you and you have filled us. You've cleaned us. You've washed our bodies with your precious water and filled us with your Holy Spirit. Lord, we are your children. Lord, take our feet. Clean them, Lord, so that we can we can be exactly who you want us to be and walking where you want us to go in cleanliness in holiness. For you said, be holy, for I am holy. God, if there's anyone here that's been struggling with surrender, Lord, I pray that today would be the day of salvation. Father, there's a point to which the human heart is hardened to the point of no return, like that of Judas, Lord. But I pray that those who have been in church their whole lives or maybe have participated in church on some occasions, but have never truly surrendered the lordship of their heart. Maybe there's vices of different kinds, God, that are more important than you. Lord, today I pray that that person, if there's people here today or if there's people listening on the internet, would surrender their hearts to you, Lord, and give themselves fully into service of the King of Kings. And if the Lord can do the miracles He did. He can do the miracle in you. You might feel hard. Maybe you feel distant from God. But cast your cares upon Him for He cares for you. Come to the Lord while there is still day. Don't retreat into the dark. Come to the Lord. Repent of your sins. And come to Him and ask Him to be your Savior. There's no time to play church. There's no time. And if you do, eventually you'll be hardened and you'll walk away and you'll betray the Lord. You hear the Spirit inside of you. Surrender. 
surrender. Surrender to the Lord Jesus today and you will have life and have life abundantly. In Jesus' name, amen.